evening. We have uh, plenty of folks here live in our Cultivating Voices live poetry studio with us for today's reading, which is our wild card, open mic. If you've joined our format before, you know that we alternate our weeks between our new books showcases where we're able to share um, the work of our members poets and, and others to be able to have a space where they can share their newest books of poetry. And we alternate that with opportunities for live open mic, sometimes on our poets focus themes that we choose. And, but today it's our wild card, live open mic. Each of our readers today, and there's, there'll be 15 of them featured, uh, have joined us early to get on our platform and each will have five minutes or less uh, to share their work with our live audience here in Zoom and our live audience watching on Facebook. Welcome to all of you. I'm Sandy Noon. Um, I'm your host for today, Cultivating Voices, and I'm so happy to have all of you with us uh, for this carnival of poetry that we are about to hear. Uh, always, always interesting to see what manifests in the wildness of the wild card open mic. A little bit before we head to the live open mic, thank you, um, is we began our reading series in March 2020 in response to um, the pandemic. We started as a Facebook group and we've been hosting a weekly reading every Sunday for the pleasure, um, interest, edification, and artfulness of our over 3,000 members that uh, join us live and watch very, very, uh, with, with much dedication, uh, our recordings that we preserve on our Facebook group page. We are an intergenerational, intersectional, an international group, and we welcome the myriad of voices that emerge from this uh, incredible community that we've been able to create over the past, almost now so pushing on two years. So without further ado, let us begin the wild card open mic with a reminder to those of us, to those of you reading today, please, please, please feel free to put your contact information uh, for where folks can pick up your collections, uh, newest collections, and of course, share any information about readings that you have with our audience here. The chats are live here in Zoom. And of course, the chat is also live in Facebook. Well, let us then turn to our first reader for the live open mic. Reminder, five minutes apiece. I don't ring the little bell I have uh, <laughs> usually, but I will be paying attention. And our first reader tonight, today, it's tonight for our first reader, is Phil Lynch. And, that, and Phil will be followed by Marjorie Maddox. Welcome, Phil. Hi, Sandy and everybody. Thank you very much. Um, it is nighttime indeed, a cold night here in Dublin in Ireland. And um, but I'll try not to be too wild. Um, <clears throat> I start with my first poem, um, which I wrote uh, a few years ago after uh, a group of us had a, a, a weekend of writing, a writing retreat, if you like, in um, a very secluded sort of wooded area in the middle of Ireland. and. Um, our host on the occasion uh, who, who lent us the, the, the premises, if you like, 
uh, was involved in, in um, horse racing. And uh, I wrote this poem afterwards, and it's dedicated now, sadly, to one of our, our group that weekend who, who is no longer with us. Um, so it's dedicated to her. It's called In the Middle of the Woods. In the middle of the woods, raindrops hang in knuckles from bare bony branches before they buckle under the swell and drop in twisted patterns to sunder away in streams searching for a river. There is a silence to the rain from our warm vantage inside the wall lent window. We are gathered to work with our words, willing them to swell and drop and flow. Twelve hands at work together, apostles writing future gospels. Every drop must do its job to navigate hurdles seen and hidden. Some make it to the river, some never get beyond the fall. But all are here and real and now, as real as every breath we make before we break for food and chat about the this and that of lives well lived in our own ways, filling in our family frames, regaling with more familiar tales of artistic paths traversed before the one that brought us to sit around this table. When our host turns talk to the sport of kings, our minds race ahead to thoughts of success. Filled with the zest of our musings, Notions of falling or failing are non runners as we clink our glasses in unspoken celebration of ourselves. Um, this uh, two short ones. Um, this one, I suppose, is suitable for this time of the year. It's called Givers of Pleasure. A sudden slant of bright slips out between the clouds that hide the sun. It illuminates the late autumn leaves, some still clinging to shades of green among the vibrant yellows, deep reds, rusty browns, fiery orange and crimsons, givers of such pleasure in their short lives and such beauty in the splendor of their dying breaths. Um, and finally, a little short one as well. This is called Night Shift. They fold into each other's parts, together in the quiet dark, like flowers closing on themselves against the predators of night, to open out with stronger hearts, to brighten garden, field, and park, like dusty books upon the shelves, their covers keeping pages white. They bask in touch of flesh on flesh till sleep enfolds them in its mesh. Thank you very much. Thanks to our first reader, Phil Lynch, joining us from outside of Dublin this evening and uh, a great way to open our live Open our wild card live open mic. Uh, just to let you know, we have all 15 of the features already signed up, and we have we also um, have a waiting list, and are pretty sure that we won't get beyond now. Um, we won't, we won't be able to get to get to anyone beyond who we have signed up at this point already. Thanks for coming in early to uh, sign up everybody. And I just wanna let those of you who are uh, joining us at this point that if you had hoped to read, we probably would, we, we, we're, we won't, we've closed the features and the, and the waiting list already. So come on back uh, for our December open mic uh, and try again. All right, next we have Marjorie Maddox and Following Marjorie will be Barry Curran. Good Thank you, day, Sandy. Marjorie. And You're I am welcome. coming to you from Pennsylvania. And um, both of these are relatively 
recent poems. This first one is about uh, my mother who uh, died this past July, but one of the hardest things about um, the pandemic for me was being separated from her. She was in Phoenix in an assisted living facility, um, but we would talk every day by the phone, uh, by phone and Often I would sit in my backyard and we would talk about a rabbit that had copped in and out um, while she was in the early stages of dementia. So this is called Still Life with Rabbits and Phone. It is only a rabbit hunkered down in this fenced in backyard, 2000 miles from her, 91 and frail, inside the locked assisted living apartment, not here. Each day across invisible sound waves, my mother and I name and rename the hare, the bunny, the cottontail, the lapin, the breathing bundle of fur and ears, hopping in and out of our words, memories, what we string across miles and years. And I have fallen in love with the rabbit who returns each evening to a small patch of dying grass in the middle of central Pennsylvania, while my ailing mother in Arizona suggest as names, Peter or Hoppy or Hope. It is only a rabbit, but one morning when my husband and son find it dragged and gnawed, its insides exposed to the bloody black world, my mouth goes dry. No way to shape the absence, hair, bunny, cottontail, lapin, non-breathing bundle of fur and ears. Like this, time hops backwards and forward, hours sprawl in the dead grass. My mother forgets the hair, bunny, cottontail, lapin, doesn't recall the namings, the conversations. Are you sure, she whispers over the phone, are you sure I'm in Phoenix? Are you certain it was a rabbit? When I next spy a small gray rabbit stretched out near the fence, I dial her number, exclaim, what shall we call him? What? Hair, bunny, cottontail, lapin, she lists. Then just like that, she lands again on hope. And then I will um, end with a poem um, I think appropriate to Thanksgiving, an ode, and this is called Ode to Everything. And I've just lost it, so there, there we go. Ode to Everything. Enough of the lamentations, open the window and sing. The world is awash with world, color dripping globe always tilting into some ah or another. Clouds stretching wide, plump happiness, even in the noisy stage show of showers, such sunny ovations. And the birds, overpopulating every poem, swoop here for free. Swallow, hawk, robin, gall, eagle. What else can be written but wings that wave horizon to horizon? And enough of windows, praise doors, Step out with arms open and eyes gathering vim and vision, grandeur trailing from worm and woodchuck, branch puzzles of woods, open boat of breeze, all brimming with hay and hallelujah and celebrate such green giving of thanks, such miraculous mercy of earth, calm valley and even this rugged rocky chain we climb now as family claiming praise as respite, holding close each breaking day, dangerous yet divine in all its gorgeous glory. Thank you. I send my green giving of thanks back to you, Marjorie, for, um, for your poems today on our wild card live open mic. Well, next is Barry Curavan and then followed by Gary Copeland Lily. Your five minutes start now. <laughs> Thanks, Hi, Sandy. Barry. Hi, Barry. Hi. 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 So you hear me okay, yeah? Yeah. 
Okay, well, first I'd like to thank yourself and uh, Don and Kim for continuing to make this all possible. And this is my first time on the live one, so thanks very much. Um, so I'm going to do two poems. Um, the first one is, um, if you're familiar with the expression when someone about someone unpleasant, where you talk about somebody turning up like a bad penny, that, and it generally refers to somebody unpleasant. So this is a poem, and it's, the first poem is called The Bad Penny. I fell in with bad company out on my own one day. I made a casual acquaintance that now won't stay away. He just fell and stepped beside me. Another distracted walker, an innocent chance encounter, introduced me to my stalker with an eerie, creepy habit of whispering in your ear, very softly spoken, very loud and clear. Doesn't know how I put up with it. He wouldn't take that shit. Have no truck with that crap, not even in a fit. Talk about a fascist, politically incorrect. Shoot the whole bloody lot of them is the overall effect. We're not friends, no, not a bit of it. Acquaintance is not much more. He's never been inside the house. I bid him with you at the door. He gets so hot and bothered. I expect his mouth will foam. Maybe he's a decent guy behind it all, but I wouldn't bring him home. He's my own little crank and whine monster. Disapprover of all I've ever done. He'll never meet my daughter and stay a stranger to my son. Still he turns up when shit hits the fan, when my own little world's gone mad, when I've kept things too long bottled up and I'm frustrated, grim, or just sad. I fall in with bad company when Maud and I have grown. I fall in with bad company for a natter, a bitch, or a mo. I fall in with bad company when there are slights to avenge or atone. Beside myself with anger, I fall in with my own. One. Thank you. That was the first one. Um, <clears throat> uh, the second poem has a has, has the rare distinction of appearing on a, an album that also featured Mr. Philip Lynch. Um, when the, the when I uh, before the lockdown, the most frequent uh, event that I would have gone to was one called the Circle Sessions uh, in Dublin City Centre, and uh, they produced an album album about three years ago, just around now, three years ago, and uh, this was my contribution. And when I wrote it, the poem was called Those People. And when I wrote it, I called Those People a poem about branding and blame. And shortly after I kind of put, it was published, some of my friends said to me, said, that's a great poem about othering. And I didn't know what othering was, but they were right. It is a poem about othering. So it's called Those People. There's no such thing as those people. Those people don't exist except in the minds of those other people who need them so they can insist that one thing defines a multitude with some defective gene that keeps them outside the program, makes them a blot on the scene. Because those people and their bestial minds, you just can't penetrate. We should build them all a little camp where they can go and concentrate. Those people corrupt our children. Those people took your job. Those people are the difference between a just cause and a mindless mob. The difference between blind allegiance and exploring and niggling doubt. The difference between following orders and stopping to think it all out. For who did the Fuhrer want fewer of? Those people. About whom did the Generalissimo generalize? Who does the Emperor find impurer? Those people. It's those people that despots despise. The only place for those people is in some football hooligan song and any rational argument. Those people don't belong because there's no such thing as those people. But the concept will persist in the words of those other people who need them so they can exist. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Barry. And I want to just also, you know, I thank you for posting. Um, I'm glad to have you live finally with us because you've been with us for, oh, so many months. Great to have you. All right. Oh, great, to be, great to be able to do it. Thank you. Thank you. 
Well, next is Gary Copeland Lilly, followed by Kellyanne Parker. Hello, Gary, and welcome. Good to, so glad to be able to hear some of your work today. How you doing? Doing all right. Yeah, man, this is this is cool. Thank you much for this. You know, wow, it's been a fast two years, huh? Really, but look at but look at it, man. You got a lot done. I'm going to start with uh, uh, my first poem is How I Survive on Sabbath. House of the Holy in a minor key, found in the pages of ragged hymnals. What sacred is held in the chambers of the heart, taken and washed in the river, holy water, holy words sprinkled on all my failings. Behold, by the one wing descending angel, the hypothesis above my bald head is that we are saved, that God is a banjo playing blues man. In the cold, hard rain, we rise warm and dry. Hear car horns blow in the distant traffic. Magnify him and you will find me pint bottle of scripture in my back pocket, walking in the alley of answered prayers. And um, this is my last poem. Uh, prayer in three parts to see if God is listening. which is a, excuse me, which is a good question these days. One, if a power line of crows is called a murder, a canopy of ravens is a choir. Everyone wants the best, the good Google Moogle we cannot wait to make our own. We look to the hills for our help, O oh Lord, our strength, O oh Lord of the unemployed, our redeemer. Is there shelter in a time of storm? Two, all things are activated through servitude, mercy, not just to others, but also to myself. Should not love inspire us all? Hard times swarm a nest of angry wasps. But when the good news comes, we sing hallelujahs. Dear God, dear God, should I have to talk in tongues? Three. On the street corner across from the grocery store, is this how the Lord will rapture us away? Like a dazed man in sleep wrinkled clothes at the temple steps waiting for Christ and the sign he holds saves it all. Lord, help me get through. A woman in blue passes him a bag of grapes through the window of a Fender bad Subaru. Out of work, waitress, waitress, rent due, barely making it. But they both reach towards each other, and their salvation comes, oh Lord, like that, just like that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Gary Copeland, Lily, folks, I just want to remind everyone that please, if you're reading today and you have and you have your collections available, please feel free to put them in the chat where we uh, have some very modest folks who have read with us already today. And uh, I want to make sure that if those of those who might be hearing folks for the first time have an opportunity to uh, partake of of your of all of your work uh, in 
uh, your books or chat books form. So please, please don't be shy to put that contact information in the chat. Well, next we have Kellyanne Parker, welcome, and followed by Martina McGowan. Wow, we are really fortunate today. We've got a great reading list. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. This is such a special place. Um, I put in chat my upcoming chat book called Down the Foggy Streets of My Mind, coming out from Nomadic Press. It's available for um, pre-orders um, now. Um, the book is about my journey um, uh, of survival and, and living with dissociative identity disorder, um, which used to be called multiple personality disorder when I was first diagnosed 30 years ago. So um, I'm gonna read a poem from the book. Um, just a trigger warning, this poem is about um, supporting someone with um, depression. And for anyone who has either lived with depression or supported someone in such, we know that th that can be almost insurmountable at times. Um, this first piece is called The Abyss. It's a beautiful day, only you aren't part of any of it. I see you contemplating the water's edge and you begin to walk slowly out into the water. I watch at first unconcerned, then hold my breath and wait for what I know is coming. You walk slowly, intentionally, not stopping until you pass the first and then the second break. I start yelling, telling you not to go out any further, but you aren't listening. You just keep moving further away from shore until a large wave grabs you and pulls you further out. And I'm yelling for help and people jump in and paddle out. And I swim to where you are and you go under just before I reach you, but you don't fight it. This strange force pulls me down too and I fight and I struggle to get to you. And the bubbles, go up to the light toward freedom. But you and I, we just keep going down, down, down into the abyss where the light starts to fade and the sound is muffled. I try to reach you, but you look if, give me that look as if to say, it's too hard. And I, my lungs feel like they're about to burst, but all I see in you is resignation, but I won't stop. I can't stop. I won't. And the bubbles go up to the light toward freedom. But you and I, we keep going down, down, down into the abyss where the light is just a speck at the surface and all I can hear are the sounds of my own struggle. And the rescuers, busy themselves in a flurry of activity at the surface. And I, I negotiate with God, trading everything to bring you back. And the bubbles go up to the light toward freedom. But you and I, you and I, you and I don't. Thank you. That was my first piece. Um, my second piece is a newer piece I wrote this week and it's so still a work in progress. It's called Two Stories. The way to destroy a woman, sorry guys. The way to destroy a woman must be with a man. For a woman loving a woman never ends in decay, never demolishes nor traps the spirit or shuts her in a lantern with her light flickering out. Loving a woman, she may instead supernova or self-combust or have heart disemboweled with a wreckage of an emotion. Still a gruesome crime scene where love is smeared and spattered on walls, where pools of tears turn dark as they dry around the edges. 
where your mind investigates, tries to, tries to reconstruct a story that is really two stories, one hers escaped and one yours deceased. And the ambulance of hope tries to resuscitate phone calls, CPR text messages, bring back a faint pulse, one that says that this story hasn't ended. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kellyanne Parker. I do, of course, uh, hope that we will get you signed up for our new book showcases for in the upcoming season. Uh, there you go. <laughs> We're working on that. I'm working on that uh, list right now, actually. So um, fantastic. I'm not supposed to be commenting on things, so I must move along. But um, again, I, I appreciate everyone's brave and beautiful work today that they're bringing. Well, next we have Martina McGowan. I'm going to put in a little plug because you're going to be on Quintessential Listening uh, this week with uh, our very good friend who is often here with us on Sundays, uh, Michael Anthony Ingram. Uh, so feel free to put that in the chat, Martina. And of course, folks, uh, listen in uh, where Martina will be talking about and reading from her collection, I Am the Rage, as well as other uh, as well as other poems, I imagine. And following Martina McGowan will be Isaac Cohen. So take it away, Martina. Thank you, Sandy. Um, I'll give a trigger warning. I mean, anybody who's heard me read before, you know, the standard trigger warning for most of what I read. Um, this is from a recent memory. This is a fairly recent poem, still a work in progress. Uh, Freshman Flames. Walking home from the Rathskeller, still laughing thinking we were some place safe. The smoke invades the crisp air. We smelled it long before we see the orange glow pouring over the hills of Troy, flames leaping from an engineering marble, a mammoth cross covered in meal tickets, burning on the freshman lawn with its requisite mob in tow. An octoroon dressed as an imperial dragon, never one of us, never one of them, now spotting us as we come over the rise, wishing he were someone else altogether, or maybe just somewhere else. A burning cross, the quintessential symbol of terror, not in the deepest south, but in the hills and mountains of the far north, where much could have been changed along the way, but it never does. Hope always lingers just over the next rise. This one will be a little bit lighter. This is from um, a building a, a, a book of hours. This is the pause. Mid-afternoon, the pause comes quietly in form and flow in practice, always in practice, never completion, never perfection. Muscle memory sets in, freeing the mind to relax and wander. The mind's eye sees grace and beauty and movement, peace and poetry and motion. As my clothes catch the air, I am the salt water air billowing sails, the wind beneath flamingo wings. I become the clouds, the earthy smell of chrysanthemum, the evening bird song, the first taste of summer peaches, the morning mist and the evening dew. I am everywhere and nowhere, flowing in form. I become the center, I am the pause. And final poem, uh, this was actually just written yesterday. Um, same trigger warning as the other poem, Processed. The wind rushes the flat terrain, seeking safety in the mountains, punctuated by the swish of cars and the shocking waves from planes. Blue-green lights flood the El Paso airport, resembling a tranquil ocean floor leading up to the red lights of the processing center, transforming people into commodities, like sardines stuffed into cans to be taken to their final rest, or tuna caught, pulled apart, then pieced back together, held over in containers to be processed at a later date. In the dark, one robotic voice speaking in measured cadence, 
wait, 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 speaking to no one as the streets are virtually empty. Wait, wait, wait to send the families back home, peace together. Wait, wait, or wait to let them in. Wait, wait for the cacophony to relent. Wait. Wait so we can reconsider. Wait. Wait to liberate children from cages. Wait. Wait for our humanity to return. Wait. Wait. Wait so we can stop ourselves. Wait. Can we stop ourselves? Wait, what? Thank you. Thank you, Martina, and I've always, I've always appreciate people bringing and, and the, the opportunity I have to hear their newest, newest work, uh, you know, hours, days in the making of uh, astounding. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Next, uh, today we have a group that's, that's, that's joining us from all over. So we get to go to Israel now and hear a few minutes with Isaac Cohen and followed by Billy Brown over in Albuquerque. Hi, Isaac. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Donna. Martina and uh, all uh, all my friends. Isaac Cohen. Isaac Cohen. The German. The first paint brush. Where to go? A scarf. Square. A body or portrait. But you know, your soul didn't rest uh, until the picture is finished. And uh, now, uh, now many resume at a point. As the coin, the real dream. I dream streets will be pure and clean. People will secure their environment. No paper, no tax in the street. All materials will be recycled. The atmosphere will be fresh and clear. I wake up. My dream is realist. I dance with Mother Earth, the angel of the throne thing. Hallelujah to the people who listen to the God and unite the world. Hallelujah to the people who listen to the God and unite the world. Thank you. I the coin Israel. Thank you, Sandra. And thank you, all my friends in the world and uh, United and Canada. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Later evening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, later evening for you, of course, Isaac Cohen. We now come back over the back, travel all the way across to the Southwest in Albuquerque with Billy Brown 
and then we will head on over to Australia with McMesa. Hi, Billy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandy. Hello to all my friends. Um, I'm going to read two poems that are not by me from my latest anthology, the Fixed and Free Poetry Anthology 2021. And I'm happy to see several friends who are published in this book, including Sandy and uh, Martina and several others. And also I want to acknowledge that several people here today are going to read for the first time at Fixed and Free in our December 9th reading. So I look forward to welcoming you there and I will put my name and my email address uh, in the chat. Uh, the first poem is by Anastasia Anderson, who is a, an Albuquerque poet who for many years has taught poetry workshops in conjunction with the uh, University of New Mexico. Uh, this is called, and I was very surprised to get this poem from her. It's called In Praise of Jealousy. Jawed, greedily meted, poetry woe. Oh, batter me here. Pepper the cut with salt and more salt. The ulcered core, the bloody dread center of my well-dredged sore, stunned and stunted ego. Validate my tantrums fuel with utterly guttural curses, all spice to burn my tongue. Urge me to dig down and drown me in a green word salad. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and the second one is by a dear friend of Fixed and Free who died in December, 2020 of cancer who probably uh, read at Fixed and Free more often than almost any other poet over the 13, 14 years we've been in operation. Her name is um, Eleanor, uh, yeah, Eleanor, <laughs> uh, Eleanor Stewart. Uh, for those of you who have your books, it's on page 16. It's called City of Peace in commemoration of August 6th, 1945. I was hired in Tokyo by a language school in Hiroshima. I didn't want to go there, but it was the only full-time job. So I bought a Momiji Banzai at the Asakusa temple and rode the Shinkansen with it trembling in my hands. Once there, I was taken to dinner and to a place to live in a ninth floor apartment across from a mall where an etched metal sign announced how far it had been from ground zero, where it had been in elementary school. I was afraid to go to Peace Park because I was an American. One early Sunday morning, I found the courage and on my bicycle on the little bridge, I met an old woman who smiled, Ohio gozaimisu. So on August 6th, the day of remembrance, I went again. All the statues were brilliant with paper tsuru. Monks chanted outside the ruins of a building preserved from that day of infamy when the sun exploded. I felt so guilty, so ashamed. But then an old man with keloid scars on his face offered me a cup of green tea, respectfully in both hands with a bow. And I bowed respectfully and received it. He smiled at me and I felt forgiven. He knew. Sometime later, I was asked in English what I thought of the Pacific War and the bomb. I said, it was a terrible thing to do, but I had to add, Japan's military caused it to happen. The young man who'd asked nodded sadly. He knew. There were protesters in favor of flying the rising sun flag and those against having a symbol of war in Peace Park. They handed out flyers on both sides. As the evening arrived after a profound day, the loveliness of thousands of lighted lanterns floated on a river once filled with bodies, while the ashes of 10,000 unknowns lay under a blanket of paper cranes. 
every American who is so proud of the Enola Gay and Los Alamos and the success of the bombs should be required to travel to that city one time in their lives and be forgiven. You see, they didn't choose to hate us. They want to be known as a city of peace and have built a mosaic tower with an origami crane to stand at the harbor and speak beauty instead of pain. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Billy Brown. Folks, if you've not been to a fixed and free uh, anthology reading or uh, open mic, I highly, highly recommend them. It is a, a, a carousel of poetry always. And Billy does a great, great job of hosting. So thank you for um, reading Eleanor's work. I, re I remember hearing um, her work when she was still reading at Cactus and with you and always, I had actually opened to that poem this morning um, first when I opened the book today. So interesting to have you read it today. Thank, thank you, you, Sandy. Yeah. All right. Well, as I said, friends, we get to hear Mick Meza today and followed by Mick. I'm so glad that uh, Michael Durack is with us um, from over in uh, with probably poems uh, from his book from Revival Press. So uh, we'll hear from Mick first. Hi, Mick. Hi, uh, hi Sandy. Um, thanks for this opportunity to read. I'd like to thank RASP, Redmond Association of Spoken Word, for this poem because uh, it's a Tuesday. Uh, once a month, we get together and edit each other's poems. And I'd like to acknowledge past, present, and future elders of the Wadunjuri land on, on the land I reside in. Okay, here's a poem. It's called Shattered Dreams, Part One Poetic License. My love lives in the United States. Nonna told Nonna. Nonchalant, he sang a song in deep soprano tone. Did she love him till the day he died? No one knows. Shortly after they married, Grandpa left for the States, left her alone in a village with a baby in her tummy, a house, more of a four person tent. Now that's the way it was then. And she waited for a ticket to be reunited with her man a future for his family, which shone bright in him at Alice, Al at Alice Island. Froze of darkness increased its weight. A lightning beam through the thunderstorm carried him to Havana. A future was cracked, adjusted and replanned. The dream had evaporated to the land of the free, kept alive by moving off to an island territory. If I can't get her to America, then to the Americas we come. Eight years his courage succumbed too numb to write, did he sit in the bar on a hot, humid, tempestuous day, checking out the broads, the musicians at play, playing cards, having a chat. Where did you work? Where would you look for a job and what did you cook? How quickly did you learn Spanish? I never heard you speak. These questions birthed in imaginings, wonder and seek. I shall, with my inquisitive mind, give me pleasure to follow your trail to answer all the above and below. Did you find love? Did you have other children? Did you gamble at the casino? Did you meet Fidel as a kid? Swimming at the beach? Did you party on the beach? Did you think of those back home or just a job? Or just a zombie stare? City living's pace? Get the gremlin, gremlins asleep at or the nightmare of being shell shocked in the haunted dreams of a broken man. Did your lifestyle collapse when the government official came calling that your wife had sent word that morning that you should return back to your family again to cut wood, make charcoal, and farm the land? Now your father four, they've moved offshore, all from a man who traveled the world and back again to a woman who said that her heart was for the man in America who dreamed of living a better life. Nonchalant, he sang a song in its deep soprano tone. Did she love him till the day he died? No one knows. Part two, fact. 
The inquiry led to my auntie who filled the gaps, granddad. You were born on a farm next to Nonna's. In July 1916, you trained to be a hero, transported to Veneto, fight against an empire, watch a man shot, gas, screaming the charge over the trenches with your mates, eat by my starve, your stomach in knots, watch a carrier bird strip the soul, have it bound. Never returned to a town of luggage you didn't take. Made your way to Argentina, dodging the Spanish flu. Did you get kicked out or return willingly? And there was none on the farm next to yours and you, you didn't inherit. She was promised to another man in the States. He found her on the farm. She married in 1921, rejected, he left. So did you to the US where you boarded a ship, expelled after a year, expelled after a year, made your way to Cuba, worked. Oh, I lose pace. Oh, kicked it. That's back. There was none on the farm. Expelled after he had made your way back to Cuba. Worked on a, for a firm who advertised in the village. You living with your dream time explosions. You the fought for her child and your family pinned to the ground, forcing her to sell. She battled on while you fought your how. An ad placed in a Cuban newspaper of missing persons made its way to you. You made your way back with the clothes on your back. Skin and bones repatriated by government you'd fought for. In 1930, after a nine year journey of world travel, you rested your soul, laid down your legacy, a World War I medal, dad's enlistment in the Garibaldi Regiment. You both married older women, left them, returned. I was opposite. Mine younger, I bounced to and fro 10 times and left her for good. The curse of the generation lifted its chains. Like you, children departed, never returned for you on Nonna's funeral. This timeline tells me your movements, not your thoughts, your actions, honorable. The end, you found love in your family again. Thank you. Thank you, Mick Mesa. Epic story, epic story. And we, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, eager to, get some folks in off the waiting list. So I'm going to go right over to Michael Durack and Michael will be followed by Charlene Neely. Uh, thanks, Sandy. And uh, thank you, Kim and Don for keeping this wonderful platform uh, available to us all. Uh, I'm going to read two more recent poems. Uh, the first one is uh, prompted by my favorite uh, Paul Simon song. And I've included uh, an epigraph uh, from, from the song. Um, the title of the poem is Looking for America. And the epigraph is Michigan seems like a dream to me now from America by Paul Simon. For his starting point, he chose Saginaw, Michigan, stuck out his thumb and took off to look for America. Four days of hitchhiking, nights spent in shakedowns, scooped up in Fenton, Dundee or Ann Arbor by a Ford Mustang or a Buick Riviera and set down in Toledo or Elmore. Then back on the hard shoulder to solicit Dodge pickup trucks or Chevrolets. Searching for America, but finding everywhere vestiges of the old world, Brighton and Berlin Heights. Florence and York, Petersburg, Wexford. After the Twin Towers fell, I crossed the Atlantic, sat in a cab at the toll plaza of the Holland Tunnel, and daydreamed myself onto a Greyhound bus with a girl and a pack of cigarettes and some Mrs. Wagner pies, backtracking through Delaware and Maryland on the Trail of America out to Pittsburgh. PA. That's the first one, and uh, I hope uh, my American geography stands up to scrutiny. Uh, the second poem is uh, a memory poem. Uh, it goes back to my first experience of seeing and holding a guitar. Uh, a young man, a neighbor of ours, had bought a guitar and brought it into our house to show it off. And unfortunately, nobody in the room, including the owner, 
had the slightest notion of how to tune it or play it. So the poem is called Guitar. Well, we managed to make music sometimes, dragging our Christmas harmonicas across our lips until they bled, or piping the opening notes of the dawning of the day from squeaky tin whistles. And we envied the gifted ones whose hands could twiddle the buttons of a gaudy accordion to make it play the rose of Arne Moore. But that first guitar left us all flummoxed. The one that Johnny Harvey hauled into our kitchen. We lifted it, cradled it, positioned our fingers here and there, ran them across the strings, making metallic sounds, but no music. Its owner, too, clueless about keys and chords. Like the auctioneer's hammer that never drove a nail, here was an instrument that never played a tune. I thought of Johnny Harvey years later when my brother was teaching me the streets of Laredo. And when I, in turn, passed on my three chord legacy to a daughter wide eyed and euphoric at having cracked the DGA enigma of love is all around. Thank you. Wonderful to get to hear your poems for you this evening. Michael Durack, thank you so much. And next we will hear from Charlene Neely followed by Meg McLeod. Hi, I'm here from Nebraska and I have allergies galore. So I'm sorry for the raspy voice. <laughs> this is my book, The Corn Fairies, Wigs and Other Poems and I'm gonna read from it today. Um, I'll read The Corn Fairies, Wigs first. The Corn Fairies, Wigs. Dad always had us girls Detasseled a smaller cornfield between the house and the road. Detasseling is hard, hard work and very boring. Walking up and down row after row of corn. The sun beating down means sweat. So unladylike, running into the cuts and scratches the sharp leaves inflicted. But the summer Darla decided to become a beautician, had all the town folk driving by. Every fourth or fifth stalk of corn sported a miniature wig styled especially for the corn fairy who lived in that field. As toddlers, each night's bedtime story was a corn fairy adventure conjured up by our mother. And now the field displayed proof of the tiny fairy's existence. Her wigs hung out to air in the sun. There was a yellow one pulled into a single fat braid perched on top of the ear of the first plant. And four stalks later, the long strawberry highlighted tresses were gathered with darker braids. And then thin honey colored braids that wrapped from the center of her forehead to keep the sunlit silk from falling in her eyes. And so on down the road that bordered the dirt road that led to the highway, each festooned with tiny daisies, primroses and violets she found in the ditch as though planted there on purpose and then just in time to burst into bloom on the exact morning that Darla reached out to pluck them. And this next one has a epigraph. The poem is called Last Night. The epigraph, I never know when or how she will arrive. She keeps her own clock and calendar. Once she walked into my kitchen wearing the dead body of my grandmother, a bit eccentric in her ways, 
my muse always amuses. That's from Jardinier number one. She wore pythons on her feet, blackbirds dangled from her ears, while an octopus clung to her shoulder as she pedaled furiously down the street on the zebra-striped bicycle she only uses when speed is important. All the while, a dozen colorful jellyfish danced merrily on the green sea of her chiffon dress and floated in the breeze as she created. And even now, I'm sorry, and even though it was a two o'clock in the morning, I bolted out of bed, grabbed my glasses, my pink pen with a lamb's head where the eraser should be, a journal, a my journal, a souvenir from Cunard's Queen Mary II Transatlantic Crossing 2019. Though the closest I'd been to the ocean was to dip my toes and proceeded to write every word she whispered. And that's the way my muse comes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Charlie Neely. I think that uh, Kim and I in particular know detasseling well <laughs> from our time in Nebraska. Thank you so much. And next we'll hear from Meg McLeod and followed by Cynthia Steele. And folks, um, thanks for staying within your lanes of the five minutes. And I'm very optimistic that we're gonna get to at least a few of those folks on our waiting list. Thanks so much, Meg, and welcome. Hello, I'd like to read four poems. Two of them are very tiny, and I'll begin with those two, and then two longer ones. They're all new poems, November poems. I have you all here, my lost loved ones, captured in frames of wood and glass. The moon is full tonight, opening the portal for the quicksilver moment when I feel you whispering across my face. The second poem is an observation. And we've had very, very gray weather, a lot of rain, and I was looking out across the the beach and this is what I saw. Breathing salt rain, people move slowly along the shoreline. Indistinct shadows, a double rainbow holds the bay. A black dog chases a red ball joyfully, for he does not see the mustard sky. He does not feel the dissonance or the thorn of November deflating the year, slowly slowing the pulse into wintering. The next one is a, a love poem, kind of. Snowdrops emerge quietly in hidden places, like love that grows out of a gray winter, shivering and uncertain subject to a destiny not chosen, blooming and fading as the seasons dictate. Tender is the heart. No blatant blousy trumpeting, only perfection perceived, as side by side the light of one tangles with the other. Watching a blue horizon, I step into his mystery. He understands but he will not cross the bridge to lie beneath cherry blossom in that country where the red river flows. He will choose to follow the moon in the orbit of angels somewhere out of reach. My last poem is called Weaving. What are you doing? The question is in his eyes. I am weaving water and air on the loom of time. My answer floats above us in a cloud of confusion. The waves are the most difficult, I continue. 
especially when the moon is full. She brings storms with waves impossible to manage. When they settle down, I tie in their softened edges, mixed with seabirds' feathers and the grey light of morning air. I place other things carefully, moments, minutes, hours, days, nights, moonlight, conversations and silences. He is staring at the space between us. What are you making? A remembering, a tapestry. Close your eyes, put your hand in mine. Now you see it, don't you? There we go. That's it. Thank <laughs> Too long. you so very much. Thank you very much for listening. Beautiful contemplative poems for us all. And Thank you. We will hear from Cynthia Steele, followed by Harvey Sauce. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you. At which point of the winter are we? At which point of the winter are we? Current branches lose their graceful, nearly translucent frozen leaves to a winter come early and fall so far down. Berries round curvaceous with bumps stand stark bare red, pronounced in the snow, hovering in the air out my window, begging for photographs. So I, so I slide the grooves to the left, remove the screen to satisfy them, capture a few patient, colorful, then monochromatic stills from the sill, the white encrusting them, reminding me of well-wrapped wounds whose origins come from so long ago. Parents who have nothing to give, raising us on a wing and a prayer like magpies screeching, bossing the dogs around in the early afternoon. Birds in our yard take seeds quickly before the canines surround them, frighten them off. What part of the winter is this? The winter of our disconnect is over. The winter of our peace exists in two degrees. I have learned to wear extra to protect myself when mother was very young, having us and never settling in her life till much later. She learned, sorry, I learned that she speaks like a teenager who doesn't get her way, squawks magpie talk, camp robber edgy with hunger, and me now grown, wear snow pants down parka, puffed up with protection, and this winter come early. She's now alone with her wounds, in the big house the Mennonites built after the fire. So well protected, so alone. Trunks full of pictures she'll never open. Photos of our lonely childhoods at the start of all her winters. We were her pecking magpies and she, Easy Edie, the rainbow lady, hoping for an early summer Jeans and leather jackets shivering, refusing to wear feathers puffed out for protection from early winters. Long copper hair grazing her slim back, glasses and countless vulnerabilities. One more. Frozen moment. Thank you. Frozen moment, 12 now. I'm 12 in the refrigerator section in an Alaska grocery store on a warm, clear day. He stood there, tall Wrangler cowboy, jeans with a W facing the other way, the air cool on my face and thighs, his profile, a Marlboro man. He hadn't turned around. I froze solid, my face flaming red, brain conflicted, throat constricting like a boa wrapped around it heavy and tight. 
A tear seeped down one rivet at a time. Said nothing, sniffed loudly, the only noise I made. Pulled my forearm toward my chest, rubbed my nose, side to side like Samantha and bewitched a couple times. Move on, just move on, but I couldn't. I couldn't move at all. Bare feet, dirty hands, grubby jeans, threadbare, two small t-shirts. Would he recognize me? He bought us clothes when we lived with him, but we'd outgrown them, moved on, they're gone. I'd never been embarrassed in the grocery store for what I was wearing or when mama had us pull for grapes, watching for grocery police. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Here in the dairy section, I stood there for five solid minutes while he chose milk products. I didn't feel rushed, wanted to holler out, hey, dad, all normal like. The city cowboy with dozens of pairs of cowboy boots, 70s jean jacket, boots, button up collared shirt in summer. No one was like that, tall, so straight, so careful thinking about processed cheese foods. I felt invisible, so I kept moving closer. My jaw gripped tighter, I relaxed and opened it. Snap, pop. He turns to look at me, at me, this kid, following him, hoping. It wasn't one of us, just some random kid. Didn't want no more trouble, no more trouble than we were worth. What mama said, I rubbed my nose with my left thumb, wiped it on my jeans. Then my eyes registered, he saw me, of course. My beaded headband, my cigarette joint pouch mama made me. I gave him a look of hurt, blame. It's not what I wanted to give him. Custody battle, he knew I didn't We telling what we thought would save us. That said now, we were not pure like those kids on his arm at the carnival anymore, where he won us prizes, bought us cassette tapes of Peter and the Wolf, Mickey Mouse, Fantasia. We, the kids he fought mother for, we'd insisted. He tried to give us a different life, but mother wore him down, said she changed, no. Nope. Said she, sorry, hold on one second. Sorry. Said she changed, no more drugs. All those memories rushed through my head like 52 pickup games my sister used to shuffle out of me. Cards flying everywhere. Some with the same images, some just a blur. That's what he saw when he turned around with cool, creamy Matanuska made butter in his one hand and a gallon of milk in the other. I wanted so badly for this frozen moment, his smile, his arms wrapping cold milk products around my summer warm tan self. A voice called, I thawed as he did, turned and walked away. Thank you so much, Cynthia, and <laughs> with the and no worries with the dog. <laughs> it happens to the best. It happens to all of us. And there you are. There you are. Oh, you little puppy there. All right, folks. I'm feeling optimistic. We'll get to uh, the, the waiting list. Thank you. But our two final featured readers, first up, Harvey Sauce, and then Julio Magrini. Hi, Harvey. Thanks so much for being with us. You need to unmute. There you go. Can you hear me now? Hello? You're good. You're good. Oh, oh, okay. Fine. I, I'll read uh, two poems and also invite you to check the chat where I've posted an invitation to Artful Dodgers Poetry's next open mic uh, this coming Saturday. <laughs> This one is called Wild Thing, I Think I Love You. Maybe it was one kindred spirit recognizing another, the Northern Goshawk in me, a Northern Goshawk seeing in me a sort of deep woods Hawkeye character, undomesticated as he was, though of a less enduring nature. Living an outdoor life, yet unable to put down roots. Perhaps that's why he let me feed 
him, mice from my kitchen being in no short supply, nor trapped rabbits that will never trouble a garden again. Once I remember, he took a live mouse from my hand while I held the creature by its tail, holding steady as an artist's model, showing no fear my newfound friend could have sensed and jumped on, claws and beak rending flesh beyond the healing properties of unguents and band-aids. If not quite a confidant during a short stay recalibration of getting myself straight and certainly a sometime companion who might perch on the peaked roof of my rental cabin several times a week, more quietly than any provincial theater group's reprise of Fiddler on the Roof, a Tevier more interested in mice than money, prey than prayer. From his favorite spot next to an unmoving weather vane, likely not oiled in this century, he watched me chop wood and stack it, withdraw captured rabbits from cages to be shared out for supper, dining al fresco even in the worst weather. I didn't feed him clearly mail every time I saw him, not wanting him to become too dependent on my handouts, lose those sharp-eyed hunting skills he would continue to need when I was gone. It was an understanding that we had, nothing of the rope back mountain sort, nothing Freudian about it, just a couple of wild things sharing a meal in the earth sat's black forest of Maine. Occasionally in a role reversal, he would bring me some bird he had caught knifed out of the sky, a lesser aerialist on the circus food chain, dropping it near me as if repaying a debt as a cat might. I would make a show of accepting it gratefully, proudly marching the dead thing into the house where I coffined it in an appropriately sized Ziploc to be buried after he had flown away, no disrespect intended or taken. In this manner, we passed several months together while I searched for my voice and he grew into his feathers, yellow eyes reflecting his adolescence, crow killer, rehearsing the part of winged assassin, phantasmagoric it reminding us of Stephen King. The raptor wasn't there to see me go, fully fledged by then and probably out hunting. For my part, I had achieved some small measure of wilderness self-sufficiency, having learned from his example how to tear the still beating heart out of a living thing. The second one is called, choose some other language, dear. Uh, there are three references to different spellings of the word old, O-L-D, O-L-D-E, and A-U-L-D. I am decidedly not a polyglot, not versed even in old, old, old English, as you well know, your ecstasies spoke in tongues to me. When you would read Chaucer aloud, stopping occasionally to explain about the miller's daughter, I could hardly follow, lacking that genius loci necessary for multilingualism, being a fallow field sort of guy in whom seeds of French and Spanish one year each refused to grow. Unlike you, not able to parse road signs in Farsi or locate a restroom in Galicia, however urgently I had to go, La plume de matante forever engendering a Rubik's cube puzzlement in me. So leave me, if you must, with a cat o' nine tails tongue lashing of words I won't understand that send me running to an online translator. Tossing back over your shoulder some good night and good luck salt in the wound. A Wiedersehen liebchen lieb ist kaputt or a revoir Au revoir, mon amour. Zejin, proche, assalam alaikum, intelligible to Germans, French, Chinese, Russians, or Arabs, respectively, to you perhaps, but not to me. Implore love's lost language of souls in limbo, a leave taking, allowing wiggle room like the Hebrew shalom. Pull from your grab bag of lingos, a poly seam star I can wish upon, some valediction come salutation that could as easily mean hello as goodbye. Thank you. 
Thank you, Harvey Sauce. And that reminder of check the chat for the reading coming up Saturday, the Artful Dodger reading series. Thank you so much again. Always great to hear your work. And our final featured uh, poet for the wild card op live open mic. And before we get to the before we get to a few on the wait list, Julia Magrini, welcome. Thanks for closing us out for the features today. Greetings from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and thank you to everyone. Uh, 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 for making this possible from Creative Voices. Very much appreciated. Uh, this uh, first poem is from my forthcoming book, uh, The Color of Dirt. And uh, it is about the uh, process and work of art. And um, we had just returned from uh, Paris where we visited Pierre Lachey's Cemetery. Uh, where Oscar uh, Wilde is buried on Avenue Caret. And this poem is called Artists in the in and the Intelligentsia. Clouds of mystery veil beatified innocence sliding on a winding suppressed detour stacked with rocks and littered glass. Our apprentices study the boundaries and decide to investigate beyond the threshold, initiate a journey to investigate this indefinable moment, illuminate and pursue the passion and work of art. On the meandering path, they behold billboards of distraction obstructions in flashing lights and jingles. They hear the fortunate privileged ignite the fuse of commercials, advertising the business of technique to the sponge of masses. But through the destiny of internal aesthetic justice, a wondrous phenomenon of disruption explodes unexpectedly and thunders in recognition by nomads lost in the wilderness and the mayhem of world. They are conducted by an artist's instrument to the gods of harmony and the explanation of humankind. The iconic slumbering artists of history decay prominently in Pierre Lachaise, jangle with the breathing collective leftovers, subsist around mediocrity and size, outcast, peculiar, and marginalized. The craft is camouflaged by the intentionally bewildered, senseless, to the possibilities of achievement and the thunderous truths of the invisible as they disintegrate and withdraw to obscurity, exalting the stars with their answers. The medium and the touchstones of civilization were defined through history as an artist's production that begets the manifestation of us. These chosen few, these artists exploring the challenging corridors of consciousness pursue the natural continual reflection and expression of what it is to be human. Hear the melodies of spirit, recognize delight and fury in the blending of notes, tints of color, and the composition of words. In this concordant and disharmonious world, the intelligentsia huddle and execute smug impersonations, categorize a courant dilettance to the innocent and novitiate who were not apprised of violence and the camera is coerced in sorrow and pans 
to Avenue Caret in Père Lachaise, where the lips of Oscar Wilde contort even tighter. Thank you. Oh my gosh, that I, I can't think of a, a more perfect poem to close us out for today. Um, I'm so grateful for uh, for our feature for our feature reading. My waitlist folks who've been waiting. Thank you. Oh, beautiful, everyone. Um, I'll read everyone's names at the end. That read. Let's get to um, one poem a piece from. I believe we have four folks on, thank you, Kim is nodding yes, four folks on our waiting list. And if I get off of here, we'll get to hear from each of you. Uh, first, we have Corin Damas, thank you. And welcome. Ah, there we go. Now I'm not muted. Okay, I'm going to do a poem that I wrote um, that is about a woman who is finding herself madly in love and really afraid that she's going to lose herself. So here we go. Lover, you cover me in my gray chair with a red blanket and I, I fall into a fitful sleep. I dream of you. You're a snake in my bed. I sense you nearing, coming right for me. I, I go fetal, cover my breasts with my blanket. I'm scared to touch you, scared to be touched by you, scared of how you will feel, but you weave your way around my leg and teach me to like your cold skin and to joy in the speed with which I cool to you. Your scales feel rough against my thigh and with your slither from my hip to my shoulder to my elbow, I, I relax. Your in my ear is enough to quiet the city of thoughts in my mind. Turn down the bebop. Your on my neck as you shake your rattle over my navel wakes my skin in such a way that I feel not only your skin, but my own alive again. And the fine hair that populates the landscape of my body rises up to you in the pregnant moment before you swallow me whole. You're muted, Sandy. Thanks so much, Corin. Oh my gosh, fantastic to hear your work today. I'm gonna to move us right along to our next reader and make sure so that we keep things moving along so we can hear from each of you. Scott Norman Rosenthal, your one poem for today. This is called The Card. This is from way back in the uh, 77 with, uh, produced uh, during Stephen Dunn's workshop. When I pulled it from my sleeve, it was a heart, a small deer. With a wild song and a lasso, I pursued it. It shrank into a cricket and regarded me like a lover suddenly gone cold. When I picked it up, it was a queen of hearts, too late to finish the hand. Thank you. Scott brought the wild card to us today. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> All right, we have now the second to last of our readers for today on our wild card open mic, Matt Mooney. Matt, you need to unmute. <laughs> there you go. 
Ooh. Matt, we might be having a little bit of technical difficulty. Hold on. There you go. There you go. Is that okay? Yep. Okay. The poem I have for you, and thank you, thank you for setting me up on the, the end of the night. It's great. I'm glad to get on the cultivating voices bus tonight. Come back. Come back again to be as you were before, by land or sea or sky, and shine your smile with all its warm glow. Your alabaster beauty will breast the waves of time and space by the waning moon to where I'm waiting. And I hear a soft singing, Hallelujah, hallelujah. As you join me here on an island sprung from the ocean bed by a spell that binds us closer, we'll explore its many wonders by mountain paths to wind and fern, wild flowers and rocks by the falling stream. And we climb together its peaks of exaltation. Thanks. Thank you, Matt Mooney. And we come back across the pond to hear from our last poet today, Lenora Good. Welcome. Thank you, Sandy. Can you hear me? Can hear you, yep. Good. This is very short and it's relatively new. It's a memory poem, like daddy does. I was maybe three and wanted to go potty like daddy. And I pranced, I was the princess, you know, pulled down my undies, sat on the cold bare porcelain rim. I wiggled to get comfy, slid back into the bowl of cold water. I knew I was going to go down the pipe, be flushed away. I screamed and screamed. In ran mommy, in ran daddy. They laughed when I told them I only wanted to go potty like daddy. Thank you so much, Lenora. Here, my friends, we today on our very wild wild card open mic heard from Phil Lynch, Marjorie Maddox, Barry Curvin, Gary Copeland's Lily, Kellyanne Parker, Martina McGowan, Isaac Cohen, Billy Brown, Mick Meza, Michael Durack, Charlene Neely, Meg McLeod, Cynthia Steele, Harvey Sauce, Julio Magrini, and Corin DeMoss, Scott Norman Rosenthal, Matt Mooney, and finally, Lenora Good. Shall we unmute for a moment and show our appreciation for everyone who came today to read, as well as those of you, all of you in the audience who came to listen as well. Great audience today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> a virtual feast today, indeed, from folks all around, everywhere around the world today. Amazing. Well, everyone. I want to share with you a little bit about our next reading on Sunday, November 28th. We return with our last of our new book showcases for the month of November, featuring Carrie, Mag Carrie Magris Radna. Morag Anderson joining us from Scotland. Carrie's joining us from New York. Lillian Nekakoff and Barbara 
Quick joining us from California with all of their new books for our new books showcase. This today uh, has been, uh, as I said, a, a virtual feast, a, a wild, wild deck of poetry. And I'm so grateful for each of you joining us on our live open mic. I know you have so many choices and um, I'm always grateful when you come and share your work with, with us. Uh, some, of, some of you will be this week uh, celebrating a holiday here in the States. I wanna send my wishes out to those of you. It's a complicated holiday in the United States and also on um, many of the states here also on Friday are um, acknowledging a Native American Heritage Day. So I want to just send out um, my greetings to those of you, um, those of you on those holidays or celebrations. Uh, thank you. Well, as I always say at the end of a reading every week, um, you know, our humanity definitely depends upon our deep, deep listening. And there's been no better uh, example of that than those of those of you who showed up today to listen to each other, uh, to listen to your stories and uh, utterances, observations, passions, fears, and just your beings. Thank you again for being with us here and also being with us on Facebook during the week as many of you post there and share things with each other on Cultivating Voices, live poetry. I'm Sandy Unown, your host for today. Uh, just sending out a lot of peace and love to you all with incredible thanks as always to Don Krieger and Kim Ports Parsons for whom we could not put this together without their dedication to the process. I hope all of you have a grand, grand week ahead of you. And please, please do join us uh, next week for our new book showcase. And then as we head into our final month of 2021 with more poetry to shepherd us out into the new year. Be well, everyone. Good morning, good day, good evening, good night just good. See you soon.